study. Oh, let me see if I can get this to work. It's been a little bit of a mercury retrograde kind of start with the technological yeah. thing, and then I got to make it even more. <laughs> okay, hello? Can you? Okay. Uh, I've got some wonderful friends here handing out these okay. special origami orcas to everybody. I want to make sure everyone gets one. Um, so, <laughs> this talk is not about cetacean bycatch, but I wanted to first acknowledge everybody for being here. Thank you, and, and thank you so much to our, our hosts, Jeff and Kim, and all the work, and all the presenters, and, and the young presenters that have been so awe-inspiring and amazing. I just want to acknowledge all of you, and, and just, oh, it's just so inspiring, so thank you. And one of the, uh, in, towards the end of the presentations yesterday, there was a question about eating or comment about eating, not eating the salmon that, that um, the orcas here would be eating. And I just wanted to point out that, that uh, there's one thing that really impacts cetaceans really in a huge way across the world. And that's why I thought it was so cool that the Ocean Airs group said that they weren't eating fish and that's uh, one of the things is that nearly 308,000 cetaceans, dolphins and whales, drown every year as a result of bycatch and entanglement. And I pray that that would never happen to any of our orcas, but, you know, to any of them, of course. But just wanted to make that point and acknowledge everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm known for, to a lot of people, for my, my, my dark past long ago, <laughs> when I was in a skateboard. The computer to the smaller stand. Oh, okay. You're blocked out on this. Oh, okay. Screen. I'm just, I'm, I guess I, I guess I don't have to watch the screen. Okay. Uh, there you go. Okay. And then I'll move the mic. Okay, so. How's that? Is that good for sound and everything? Yeah. Okay, so I was, I was on the skateboard team. I was the only female member of the, of the Zephyr skateboard team featured in the documentary Dogtown Z Boys. Um, <laughs> But, but, you know, we did it for fun. A lot of us were just in it because we wanted to keep skating. We, we weren't interested in, in fame or fortune. I, I got the fame, not the fortune, but I used the fame. And anyways, people, one of the common questions is, well, how do you equate skateboarding from your days then to being an activist for cetaceans? And I would say that, well, our, our, our famous style was about surf, skating as if we were surfing. And so I still love that style, the very smooth surfing-like style. I still surf today. I still feel very grateful for my connection with the cetaceans through uh, my encounters with them out in the water, which have been quite incredible. Uh, uh, I'm inspired by them. Just This is the uh, Hector's Dolphin of New Zealand. I have been campaigning for the Maui's and Hectors, and Maui's is a subspecies of the Hectors. I've been working w with people, activists in Raglan, New Zealand, for about 15 years and running my various campaigns for them. Uh, I'm in awe. I mean, look at these whales. I won't even surf pipeline, <laughs> you know? I'm inspired. I, I would, you know, I, I for a long time wanted to be a dolphin, but anyway. <laughs> and the other thing is, when I learned about whaling and, and how this horrible thing had, had continued since the 1986 whaling moratorium was supposed to be in effect, and, and learning that there's never been any, any known attacks in the wild of whales on humans after so many populations were devastated, some towards extinction. I mean, literally one to two percent of the blue whale population was left. But there's never been a known attack of a blue whale on a human. So I kind of wondered, well, what sort of wisdom might be imparted if I actually had an eye-to-eye -eye encounter with a whale? <laughs> and I did this painting, because I'm also a painter, and that was the inspiration behind it. And lo and behold, within that year, I had an eye-to-eye -eye experience with a gray whale spy hopping while I was surfing, and it looked right at me about 50 feet away from me. So I think that there was a calling when that happened, and I said, well, I was already an activist for dolphins, and I thought, well, I better look into what's happening with whales. And that's when I found out in 1999, actually 2000, um, when I looked it up, and I found out that whales were still being killed. And it was roughly, you know, over a thousand a year. I am also a big sperm whale groupie, and I found out that the Japanese government was hunting, continuing to hunt in their Pacific 
uh, North Pacific hunts every summer 10 sperm whales per year. That was the quota by the Japanese government. So I decided I was going to do a series to raise awareness, and this is my fluke series from actual photo ID records that I was given f uh, permission to use from various researchers of sperm whale flukes. And you can see how unique that everyone knows that about sperm whale, like, you know, I mean, fluke identification here, so I don't need to <laughs> explain that. And uh, when the Japanese government in 2007 announced their intention of killing 50 humpback whales off of Antarctica, I just said, well, let's see what I can do. Oh, a series of 50 humpback whale flukes off of the Antarctic research catalog. <laughs> I say the whalers are killing me. I'll do whatever I can to raise awareness for cetaceans, including painting my surfboards with them. Every surfboard of mine since, oh, about 20 years ago has, my, has some sort of cetacean on them. And in 2004, wanting to raise awareness about whaling, I came up with this idea, why don't I raise awareness by engaging the public even more? Because being an artist, you know, we, we have an exhibit, and some artists are quite far out in what their paintings or installations are, but I wanted something that people could really understand and be a part of and, and something that would benefit the whales too. So how about the Origami Whales Project? That was to uh, get children from the Santa Barbara Whale Festival and all over the world through my uh, collaboration with a couple other NGOs that, that Origami Whales were sent to me. And the goal that year was 1,400, which was the quotas between Japan and Norway that year. And my friends, they helped me to hand stitch this curtain, which I was sponsored to uh, present to the International Whaling Commission of the United States and urge the US government to be more proactive about protecting the whales from commercial whaling. In 2006, I saw a very sad video about commercial whaling by Japan and how by, in the, by that time that they made the video between 1986 and 2006 about 25,000 whales had been killed and I just started crying and I said I got to do something what am I going to do I said I'll make a curtain if I can do it somehow if I can get sponsorship or whatever I'm going to make a curtain of 25,000 origami whales and present it to the International Whaling Commission I wasn't able to hold it, you know, present it in their meetings, but I was able to display it at the Performing Arts Center in Anchorage, Alaska, just a few blocks away from where the meetings were being held, and working with other NGOs, they helped to ha you know, have this happen and invited delegates, all delegates, to come to a special reception where this was also displayed. And it was quite, you know, imagine, collecting 25,000 origami whales and getting volunteers, local volunteers, to come to your store, origami whale stitching parties for days and days and hours and hours <laughs> to fold, I mean, to put that together. And then towards the, <laughs> towards us getting closer to the May deadline, I, I was taught, told that nearly 30,000 whales had been killed. So I was going, oh my gosh. But if I get 30,000, it's gonna happen. And it did because of wow. people who care. Wow. So, <laughs> Curtain of origami whales has been exhibited in other places, including Whale Day on Maui a few times, the, the big curtain I call it. And I've also uh, created various other curtains, including this one, which was 1,200 origami dolphins, which I brought to Tokyo for the first Japan Dolphin Day with Rico Berry and met some wonderful people there. Some of them are here. We're still wonderful friends and stuff. So Carrie and him and, and <laughs> lots of people that we call, you know, we're all a pod here. And I just want to acknowledge that we've all made this mig mass migration to come here for this <laughs> gathering. Um, and it's because of the children working with teachers, children care, and I want to acknowledge the, the, the amazing projects of all these students here, and, and Simon Hunt's presentation is so great, I'm so glad that he was able to, to show it today. And then all the local volunteers that have come and <laughs> hand-stitched the very labor-intensive uh, strands. Um, one of the, my next thing is that, of course, I've been working on various causes, but I've also tried to come up with things to help the Lida Tokite. And, and the first campaign started about five years ago when I was inviting the public to send me video clips of them asking Arthur Hertz, the owner at that time of the Miami Aquarium, to set to ask Arthur Hertz that their Christmas wish to Santa was to just have Tokite released. 
And so we compiled all these videos and made this video called Christmas for Lolita and, and wanted to, you know, him to take heart. He soon after sold this aquarium to Palace Entertainment. And so then the next campaign shortly after was Valentine's for Lolita. And I, you know, I refer to her as Lolita in these campaigns only because most people recognize that name rather than Tokite, which was her, her more beautiful and I think more appropriate respectful name. So then we, we you know, had this web, web page and people could download and, and, and personalize their messages on the, um, on the Valentine's, but they could also send their own Valentine's. And, and we got about 300 together in, in a couple months' time and put them in a box and sent them with a very polite letter to Fernando Iroa, the CEO of Palace Entertainment. And I asked in my cover letter to please respond, and he didn't respond. And then before that, I sent a very nice, polite, detailed letter about orcas in captivity, about Tokite's uh, story, et cetera, et cetera, and about how there are alternatives now. As we all know, and somebody brought that up, that the wonderful Lummi tribe have approached Palace Entertainment with the option of, of having virtual reality experience. And I think most of us have seen that now, of, of the, the, the uh, humpback whale leaping out of the gym floor on YouTube. <laughs> It's amazing. If you look it up, and I and I found out that uh, there's there's one in Dubai, a virtual reality theme park. that's just all kinds. And on the cover, unfortunately, I lost it with the technical thing that happened. On the, the little cover of this one, of the, one of their theme uh, the, uh, reality uh, virtual reality experiences, it was an orca leaping out of the water. You know, it's it's happening. <laughs> it, the, if you look up uh, Dubai Mall virtual reality on YouTube you'll probably find, I think a lot of people might have seen it. Has anyone, everyone seen that one? Yeah. Oh, it's so amazing. Look, Google that and find it, because you'll see there's uh, some various marine mammals of, and, and penguins. And so Palace Entertainment is a part of Parcus Reunidos. And, and Palace Entertainment is based out of Newport Beach, California. Under their title, they have 21 theme parks of various sorts, including Raging Waters, uh, Dutch Wonderland, all kinds of different theme parks. But amongst, in their title, is Miami Aquarium and Sea Life Park. And we, and a lot of us probably know about, you know, the false killer whale and the, the dolphins there and such. But there's also Parques Reunidos, which is kind of their parent company out of Spain. I hope I'm getting that correctly, because it's been really kind of confusing to straighten that out. But Parcus Reunidos also owns Marine Land and Teeps and Selwo Park and uh, Mar del Plata. So they own, combined, they own five captive cetacean facilities. And I decided that it was time for a boycott campaign. I played nice and it's time to play tough. <laughs> and so uh, this is my, my page that I've dedicated to Toki. And then the 16,425 days is our, our hashtag for the campaign because I launched it three years ago and 16,425 days are the number of days in 45 years. And I launched it commemorating the 45 year of Toki's capture. Uh, now we're approaching, as most of us know, the 48 year anniversary. And so, you know, we're, we're, I'm trying to get it all, spread the word, and I'd love for you to participate. I hope everybody got, got, got a little origami orca. Yes, okay, cool, okay, because we're gonna proceed in a little bit further with that. Uh, last year, through my letter writing campaign, and it was a boycott campaign, it's a boycott pledge. The letter, uh, if you'll, it's out in the lobby. If you haven't seen it yet, I, I hope you'll come and sign it. By summer of last year, on August 8, 1970, we had accumulated 7,191 letters, which we pre presented to the corporate office of Palace Entertainment. And I was so honored when my uh, fellow activist, Matt Sorum, former drummer of Guns N' Roses, uh, accepted my invitation and he was very much in support. It was like, hooray, thank you, Matt, and all the people that came out with their signs and banners. And we had quite a turnout. I think we had about 30 people on a Tuesday in the middle of the day because we wanted to do it while the office was open and on the day of the Pen Cove uh, massacre. And, and it's been thanks to activists all over the world. My friends in Australia collected almost 300 uh, signatures for Tokite in the campaign. Uh, we continue. There's activists all over that have been collecting and sending uh, the uh, campaign letters in to me, including some people in the audience, so your dear Mandy. And <laughs> 
So, so definitely please uh, contact me or go to our website. Uh, the information is on that origami orca next to the photo of Toki. And I'd, I'd like to just take a couple of questions because I have uh, something that I think is special that I'd like to share as well, beyond this. Because there's, okay, no questions? Great okay. work. Well, thank you. Thank you. So onward, onward. People ask me, because I've been doing these things for a very long time, I started being an activist for cetaceans about, oh, like 35 years ago I started, and it, there's a lot of things, and sadly the world's oceans have become even less hospitable for their inhabitants, and the dolphins and whales are suffering from so many things, and I say pick your battle and do it. And it's wonderful to see different groups, such as the groups here that are working on saving the salmon to save our, our resident orcas here and things. But, you know, people ask me about being discouraged, and I, and I, and I just say that, you know, you, it's, it's thanks to people who raise awareness, who take action from their passions, that things have happened, things have changed. Who would have imagined after four decades that apartheid would end in South Africa? Who would have imagined six years ago that what has happened to SeaWorld? And we all know what's happened there. Who would have imagined that, that now 20 countries across the world, that this article is saying 42, so I'm not sure how accurate that article is, but it, it seems to be safe to say at least 20 countries across the world have banned the use of wild animals in circuses. Hey. And who would have imagined that in five years, no, in three years' time, in the United States, veganism has grown as a market 500%. And 6% of Americans identify as vegan. I'm not sure if they're real vegan or not, but <laughs> that's, a, that's a little inside joke amongst vegans. <laughs> and I've been one for uh, about 15 years, so, or 17 years. So. I'm going, gosh, I'm not so alone anymore. It's so yeah. wonderful. There's so many good vegan food options in Mike's restaurant right here in Friday Harbor. about the skateboard fame, I, uh, I do whatever, I, like I said, I'll do whatever I can, whatever I can think of to raise awareness and, you know, I did this painting on, uh, for uh, this a silent auction benefit of orcas on the skateboard. Mine was the only orca skateboard, but I thought it was beautiful. And then I did this video for the campaign, just using my skateboard fame again, and I said, skaters only in concrete balls, no cetaceans. <laughs> inspired yesterday by how important it is to breach the Snake River dams yesterday listening to these wonderful presentations. I, I posted on Instagram, I, I, you know, I'm working on developing a following on social media just for this purpose, to raise awareness about my, my environmental concerns. And so I, I Instagrammed this last night and posted it on Facebook also, and I'm going to be spreading around on Facebook. And, you know, I don't have a million followers. But, you know, of course, please follow me or, you know, Origami Wells Project and, in, and on Instagram, Peggy Oki, um, so that you can, we can all continue to raise awareness and share uh, the information. People ask me, you know, how that, again, how does a skateboarding thing relate to your activism? To be a skateboarder, you have to be passionate and you have to be tenacious. <laughs> because when you hit that concrete, it hurts. <laughs> and you got to get back up because you're just so passionate about making that trick to, to, to get that front side grind in the pool. And so, and that was that move that I was doing early in the beginning of this talk. And love, coming from love, because it's what we love that we are going to work to protect. And there's so much love in this room, and I'm just so grateful. Here's a, if you want to take a quick picture of this, you're welcome to, uh, how to contact me and the campaign page for Tokite. And, uh, okay, so I just want to do a couple more, a few more minutes here. Okay, I'm going to go on. I, I also, it's also on the, the, the origami orcas that we, my wonderful friends, passed out. So back to Tokite. <laughs> it's hard to not cry. Uh, she's just such an inspiration to me. How, you know, she survived Hurricane Irma. Hello. 
alone. The Miami Seaquarium, you know, basically Pals Entertainment, basically abandoned her. But she survived. How does she do this? How after almost 48 years living in a concrete tank that small, how does she do this? She's just so inspiring to me. And I'd like to invite anybody who believes in the power of visualization to join me in a visualization now. Um, and this is a poem that I just, I just saw and it reminded me of her because she so inspires me. Okay, so this is a photo of a bay that I'd like us all to visit. And if you have your origami orcas, this is a little reminder that I'd like you to keep of, about what we're going to visualize. And if everybody, or, or if anybody who would like to participate will um, close your eyes and let me just kind of walk you through it and trust me that I won't go around and pick your pockets while I <laughs> Okay, so uh, you're on a morning walk in the San Juan Islands following a path lined with madrona, Douglas fir, with a rich wet wood aroma, maple trees with branches overhanging. You arrive at a cobblestone beach, a protected inlet, a small, calm, peaceful bay within a bay, lots of ducks, river otters. You hear the call of a great blue heron, as you look out to the water, the surface is smooth as glass, calm. There are schools of juvenile Chinook salmon, herring. Your eyes closed take in the scent of sea breeze, feeling the sunshine warm on your face. Then you hear a soft sound, louder than a whisper. You know that sound. It is a cetacean spouting and you see the lasting mist. You open your eyes and you see the lasting mist of this spout as it dissipates. Then a smooth roundness breaks the surface of the water and another spout. There are more and you can count at least seven. It is a pod of orcas. Something tells you this is L pod. One of the males breaches, then a female breaches, a calf breaches. And then you see a female breaching with that very distinctive saddle marking. It's L25, Ocean Sun. And beside her, surfacing there, is another female orca. There's something very special about this one that you have a strong sense about. You just know. It's Tokite. You see her spout and then dive, disappearing. Watching, waiting, wondering where she will surface again. Suddenly, without warning, she reappears, breaking the water with a huge breach. This day, this moment, this feeling, hold this close to your heart. Keep this feeling and vision each day. Thank you.